So today we're going to start looking at how air conditioners work. And up to this point, I, I've, I've talked about how heat moves naturally from hotter objects to colder objects. Uh, I, I claim that, it, that that's driven by statistics, which it is. Um, the ways in which it moves, we talked about that at considerable length. Uh, its effects on things, for example, melting, freezing, um, evaporating, and so on. Now we're going to look at, at two uh, objects, for air conditioners first, followed by automobiles, where they're using heat strategically. They're, they're, uh, an air conditioner does the seemingly impossible task of, of cooling, of making a cold spot in the middle of otherwise warm environments. It cools your house when, when there's nothing else around that's cool, which that seems, you know, according to everything I've talked to up, up to this point, that doesn't seem to be possible or barely possible. Uh, so air conditioners move heat against its natural direction of flow, which is I'll talk more about shortly. The other, the other object I have in mind uh, is automobiles. They're using heat to do work. I mean, they burn fuel, um, at least you know, as, as technology evolves, eventually automobiles no one will have gasoline-powered automobiles anymore, and what will I do? I'll have to, I'll have to get a different topic. Um, but ga currently, gasoline-powered automobiles burn the gasoline first. They don't, uh, they're not so, so sophisticated like electric cars, which are using chemicals as fuel, but it's in a battery. Uh, the, the gasoline is just burned, and so you got hot. You've got hot gas. And what, how can you do any work with hot gas? It's just got thermal energy in it. Well, it turns out that it's hot, and it, if you let heat flow from hot to cold, you can actually divert a little, little bit of it and turn it into work. So the car is called a heat engine because it uses the flow of heat to, to do work. A air conditioner is called a heat pump because it uses work to move heat against its natural direction of flow. Um, not quite, it, that's a, it's a little overstated, but, but basically we're, this is the story of heat pumps, air conditioners, and heat engines, automobiles. Okay, so with that, with that attempt at a, at a background, so here's a question that, that may have come up sort of in, in various contexts in your life. If you take a window air conditioner unit, so you presume we've all seen window air conditioners, they sit in the window, right? Yank it out of the window, put it in the middle of the room, close all the windows, and turn on that air conditioner. You okay with the idea? just running right on a table in the middle of your room, otherwise the room is all sealed, what's going to happen to the average temperature of the room? I'm not worried about there's a cold spot, hot spot, whatever. It, 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 is the average temperature of the room going to go down, go up, or stay the same? Any questions about the question? How many think that the uh, A, that the average temperature of the room will decrease? How about B, the average temperature of the room will increase? How about C, that it nothing will happen overall. Okay, so the majority are going for nothing will happen overall. And I'll probably get far enough into this that we'll come to the answer to that, so I'm not going to answer it yet. You guys get to, 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 to stew about it. All right, so some observations about air conditioners. They cool the air in a room. Uh, they also frequently uh, remove moisture from it, but okay, they, the, the, their primary function is to cool the air in the room. They emit hot air from their outside vents. So in case you've never noticed it, if you walk by a window air conditioning unit or the external component of a whole house air conditioner and you, and you put your hands in the, in the air near there, you'll find it's, it's hot. It's hotter air than, than anywhere. It's hotter than the outside air. It's actually, that outside unit's blowing hot air out of it. Uh, they consume a lot of electric power. This may be something you haven't noticed yet, but you probably will when you, you know, it, it, if you ever have to pay your own utility bills, you'll just start discovering, oh, whoa, uh, you can use a lot more electricity during the summer than any other time of year. And if it's really hot, use a lot of electricity. Uh, they're less efficient on hotter days. So uh, the, the hotter it is outside, the more difficult it becomes for you to cool your indoor, your indoor air, in part because there's a big, more, more tendency for heat to flow in the old-fashioned way from outside to inside. It goes from hot to cold. But also, just the act of moving the heat outside, which is what you'd end up doing, 
uh, becomes fundamentally more, uh, requires more uh, energy. Or slightly oversimplified, but okay. Uh, some air conditioning units, particularly ones in Virginia, the, the whole house versions, they can be reversed so that not only can they cool the air in your house during the summer, they can heat the air in your house during the winter, which is, uh, which is a, a cute trick and very useful and actually uh, the right way to go if you, if you can do it. The right way to heat your house if you can do it. All right, so this is background. And here are my five questions that I'll, I'll go after and try to talk about how air conditioners work. And the first of which is why doesn't heat flow naturally from cold to hot? Well, I've asked this question, I'm not going to ask it again, you've asked it a thousand times, uh, or, or talk about it. It, it. it flows naturally from hot to cold because that's the statistically likely uh, direction for it to go. And we'll look at that more, in more detail momentarily. It's not a Newton's law problem. Heat, if you've got a hot spot and a cold spot that are in contact with, it, with one another, it's physically possible for the jiggling motions in the atoms and molecules to accidentally deliver a little bit of extra heat to the hot object. It gets a little energy out of the cold object. So it can happen, but only on tiny scales and only briefly. It's, it's statistically much more likely that heat will go the other way. Uh, but the, the laws of motion don't care. Fine, you want to go heat left, right, who cares, according to them. Uh, it definitely, energy is conserved throughout this. So the only issue here is, is, is which is more likely to happen and wh what's more likely to happen by a phenomenally overwhelming odds is heat goes from hot to cold if, if you just let it, let it go on its own. So why, ask that same question again, why doesn't heat flow naturally from cold to hot? Well, now we introduce a more sophisticated response to it, and that is that heat flowing that direction from cold to hot against its natural flow would violate a new law, one, one I haven't talked about before. Uh, it's called the law of entropy. It is also known as the second law of thermodynamics, which is a totally unenlightening name, so I, so I try whenever I can to call it the law of entropy. If I refer to it as the second law, it's just because it comes out of my mouth. I know you, you all see me talk without thinking frequently enough. So it, it, it turns out it, it's a law that's there for, for statistical reasons, and it governs a lot of issues with heat flow and, and, and elsewhere in our world. So this is um, my excuse slash opportunity to introduce what are known as the laws of thermodynamics. Um, for some reason, I can remember back in college, people talked about thermodynamics as some, some horribly abstruse, un, you know, esoteric thing to get involved in. And no one ever would want to study those and whatever. They're terribly hard and all that. I'm trying to make them as simple as I can. Um, they're nothing scary. They're just, they are what they are. There are technically four of them. I'm only going to talk about three of them. The last one, we can set it aside. They govern the flow of thermal energy, so that's why they're called the laws of thermodynamics, you know, energy on the move. Um, they relate the, the two categories of, of, of energy, you know, what, is, what, what distinguishes thermal energy from the other energies which I frequently uh, say are equivalent to work. Any energy that's equivalent to work is an ordered energy. You can, you can immediately use it to do stuff. The, the electrical, the, the, the chemical potential energy in a battery, you can immediately power some car out of it. Um, the, uh, the energy in a, in a bowling ball that's on the ceiling, you can immediately power something by letting it descend, and so on. These are, these are equivalent to work. Thermal energy is not equivalent to work. What distinguishes it is it's disordered. It has, it, it has lost all the, the easy, ability to, to get things done. And so the laws of thermodynamics are really highly focused on the distinction between ordered systems and disordered systems. Your sock drawer, when you've carefully sorted all the colors and paired up every pair of socks, as opposed to when it just comes flying out of the dryer, randomly assorted, several of your socks, of course, are missing, um, always one from each pair. Anyway, 
Um, that's a disordered system. And to, to convert the disordered plop of, of socks into the ordered one, it takes effort. Uh, it doesn't happen by chance. You can't just sort of shake them and magically it, your, your clothes fold themselves and order themselves. It's a, it's a one-way street. You can, do the, you can shake the sock drawer up and make a mess of it, but you can't shake up the messy sock drawer and make an order of it. So we'll look at the three laws. The first law, which uh, it's called the law of thermal, thermal equilibrium, it was to some extent an afterthought when, they, when, when scientists were uh, codifying and inventing the, the laws of thermodynamics. They came up with it late in the game, at which point they had already named one of the laws the first law, followed by the second law. And the third law, and this one showed up, so they couldn't renumber things anymore. Once, once you've sort of committed to this and it's all, everybody's gotten used to it, you can't say, okay, from now on we're gonna refer to it as the second law. You're like, no, it's not gonna happen. So they, they wanted this one first, so, so it, it, its alternative name or official name is the zeroth law of thermodynamics. So that's just a chuckle, you know, it, does it matter? No. But it's, so this is the, 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 one of the ground rule laws that turns out to be necessary to have a com consistent view of, of the, the movement of heat. And it just observes that if you've got three objects and, you know, this canister, th this syringe, and my, and my laser pointer, if this pair is in thermal equilibrium with one another, and this pair is in thermal equilibrium with one another, that is no heat flows when I, when I bring them into contact, then the remaining pair, which is th these two, have to be in thermal equilibrium with, the, with one another. And th there are probably a, a vast number of ways in which you can formulate that same observation. But it creates, it, it, it establishes a, a consistent meaning of, of, for example, of temperature. It means that, that if, if these two objects are at the same temperature, and these two objects are at the same temperature, then whatever I've got left, these two objects have to be at the same temperature. It, it, if, if, it, if it weren't like that, you have paradoxes around. A is hotter than B, B is hotter than C, and C is hotter than A. Whoa, no, this is not going to work or they give heat to one another in that same sort of arrangement, it's impossible. So it just, it, it's the ground rules for having a, a meaningful system of temperatures and for which way heat will naturally flow. Is that okay? Um, is, it, is it worth remembering? Well, it's just as an idea that if things are all in thermal equilibrium, any pair of them is gonna be in thermal equilibrium. It's, it's all gonna work out, self-consistent. Simple law. Second law is called the law of, conser of, of conservation of energy. Its official name is the first law. So the, the law of conservation of energy, merely, um, in, in, uh, the bottom line is it, it, it observes that heat is a form of, of energy. And therefore, that there are two ways of giving energy to an object. You can do work on it. That's the mechanical means of, doing, of, of giving it energy. We talked about that way back. You can add heat to it, convey heat to it. That's the thermal means of giving it energy. And they're equivalent. I mean, they're, 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 they're both way, ways of giving energy. They're not identical or equivalent. I should be careful with that. Uh, it's written in some weird way. It's the change in the internal energy of an object. That is the energy the object has, internal energy. It's, 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 it's owned by the object. It's just equal to the heat in minus the work out. You know, why is it that? these opposite directions and stuff, I don't know, but that's the, that's the, the, the classic way of, of writing it. It just simply observes that, that you can increase the internal energy object either by adding heat to it or by adding work to it. Either one's fine. Is that okay? It's, it's no surprise. It, it just observes that energy is conserved and there's more than one way to convey energy to something. You can use heat too. All right, but that brings us to the one that matters, and we're getting there. The, 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 yeah, I'm, I'm doing three laws of thermodynamics. The first two are throwaways, easy sneezy, easy peasy. Um, the, the, it's the third one, technically known as the second one, but, but I call it the law of entropy. Uh, 
that, that, that really is, is, the, is the meat of this story. Uh, converting ordered energy into thermal energy involves statistically unlikely events. Oh, no, 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 it's, no, it's ordered energy to thermal energy is, e is statistically likely. It's easy to do. Uh, and this is actually converting not just energy, but anything that is orderly into things that are disorderly. It's always easy. It, it happens statistically. If you, if you take a, va a vase and smash it on the floor and you get little bitties, right, that ha that's very statistically likely to happen. The start is, is, the, is the beautiful vase. The, the finish is this pile of rubble. No problem. The reverse is technically very hard, uh, statistically very, very unlikely to happen. So the reverse, converting thermal energy into order energy is, is hideously unlikely uh, by itself because it involves statistically unlikely things to happen. All the little jiggling molecules and atoms uh, simultaneously move in the same direction to give an overall shove to the plunger on so, or, the, or, the, or the, the, the crank on a, on a generator and, and produce electricity. It's not going to happen. It's too unlikely. So it's the same as taking all that rubble from the broken vase and dropping on the floor again, whoosh, having it reassemble the vase. Statistically, the, the laws of motion allow it, but it's statistically too unlikely. So the, 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 the bottom line issue is statistically disordered, whatever that you know, in, in all of its forms, disordered stuff never becomes ordered stuff, not, not uh, without help. Okay? It's a one-way street. Creating, as you create disorder, you keep creating it more and more and more. Well, it turns out there is a quantitative measure of disorder. Uh, it's not just a, 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 a an arbitrary thing you look in somebody's room and go, well, we'll give them a B for orderliness. You could, in principle, actually write out a, a, a quantity of disorder that's present in their room uh, to as many digits as you were prepared to study. The, the measure of disorder, and I realize it, it's an awkward concept and it's an awkward name, as I'll say in a second, it's called entropy. You, you've heard about entropy bits and pieces. Uh, vaguely in, in, in common language, it's, it's a real quantity in physics. It has the unfortunate, uh, its name is a little unfortunate because it starts with N and it sounds, it sounds like you're going to say energy as opposed to entropy. They are completely different quantities, different units, t totally different. I, I'm warning you now that it's easy to confuse them just because of the similarities of their names. Entropy, for example, is not a conserved quantity. So um, the other thing that, it, that makes it confusing, it's not the measure of order, it's the measure of disorder. So you know, it is what it is. Um, it measures all kinds of disorder. So it includes the thermal energy, which is the disorder that's in the energy, and the, ener the, the disorder that's, that's in the, uh, the randomness of the, of, of the situation, like your sock drawer, where it's got, where it's got, it's all mishmashed, all the colors and the pairs are broken up and all that. That's, that is reflected in it, it having a higher entropy, more entropy, than it would have if it were neatly ordered, and still at the same temperature and everything. So it, it's not about the energy in, in, in these socks, the thermal energy in the socks. It's about the ordering of the socks or lack thereof. Okay, so entropy measures disorder, and it has a real value. There is. A, one could, in principle, calculate the entropy in this room at this moment. But if you measured it again, at another moment, and another, it's going to be going up more and more disorder. And that's part of the story of the law of entropy. Um, what about it? It never decreases in a system that is thermally isolated. So this is actually the law of entropy, is, is the observation that if you, if you take a system and draw a box around it, and the box I'll, I'll discuss in a second, you know, isolate it. Then, if you watch it as time goes on and measure its entropy, and measure its entropy, and measure its entropy, it'll keep, it'll never go down. I was going to say it will keep going up, but technically it's, it's allowed to stay constant. Uh, it, what will, will never happen is it will never decrease. The system will never become more orderly. Is that okay? The box I'm drawing around, Thermally isolated. Why the thermally isolated? That's, that is a cryptic name for 
you are not allowed to move disorder in or out. You're not allowed to throw out the garbage, for example. I mean, you can make the play, this, we can lower the entropy in this room, no problem. It, it'll happen spontaneously in about uh, 30 minutes. You leave, entropy goes down, because you carry a lot of it with you, okay? So that, we have to isolate the system. You're not allowed to send uh, heat or thermal energy or anything that, that uh, carries entropy with it in or out. So that's the isolation that's necessary. Um, once you have isolated it, then the entropy in the system is going to be going up. But that doesn't forbid weird distributions of the entropy. For example, you can have the entropy of one part go up more than another. You know, on, on, you know, everybody over there on the left can uh, burn your book, okay, if entropy goes up. Um, but only on one side. Alternatively, in a more extreme cases, you can actually have the entropy go down in one region. How do you do that without actually, I mean, if I had everybody move to the left, the entropy would go down on the right side of the room. But, but even without having um, people rearrange or material rearrange, we could do it by having, for example, everybody on the, on the left would tidy up all the details on the right and go back to their seat. What would happen in this is we'd, we'd have a tidier lower entropy right side and a uh, significantly more entropy filled, messier left side. In fact, the total entropy of the system would have gone up, but we would have created a region that has low entropy. And that's what an air conditioner is going to do. An air conditioner is going to take the, it's going to reduce the entropy in your house. How? It's going to get rid of a lot of thermal energy that's present in the air. Maybe leaving the air, the air molecules themselves in place. Just take the energy out of them, thermal energy out. That is an ordering process. The, the air, because it has less thermal energy in it, is, is, turns out it's more highly ordered. That's not without cost. What does it do? The air conditioner then moves the entropy to, to another part of the story, another part of the system, outside. It sends it outside. So it's, it, it's, it's a deliberate exporter of entropy out of your house into the outside world. And on the grand scheme of things, for the whole Earth, the disorder goes up. The entropy in the, the Earth goes up. Um, but the entropy in the house, one region of the system, of this thermally isolated system, goes down. It's a followable, I hope. So, here's, so here, here are the bits and pieces then. Um, the background for this is uh, thermal energy, like any form of energy, is, has, has units of energy. And the unit of energy, the classic unit of energy, the SI official, is the joule, equivalent to the Newton meter. If you add one joule of thermal energy to a cold object, and you add one joule of thermal energy to a hot object, which of these two objects, or neither, uh, experiences the greater rise in entropy? More, more, it's more rise in disorder. You okay with the question? You're adding the same amount of ener a thermal energy to two objects, one hot, one cold. How many think that the hot object experiences the bigger rise in entropy? How many think the cold object experiences a bigger rise in entropy? How many think it's, e it's even Steven? Okay, the majority are going for, for, for cold, and that's correct. The cold object, cold objects, or co an object, for example, that you cool down almost to absolute zero, has very little disorder left in it. And it's easily, it's order is easily messed up by adding one joule of thermal energy. That's highly disordering to it. Whereas a hot object's already pretty messed up as it is. It's got a lot of entry to begin with. And adding a little more thermal energy to it barely changes it. And my, my, my jokey story from the book is, is it's like, you got one wild and crazy person, you know, I, I'll, I'll vary it a little bit, you, some, some crazy person comes walking off the street, wow, I'm on you. I, I, that's probably, yeah, that's probably politically incorrect. <laughs> what is it? It's a, oh gosh. It's a, a dog and a squirrel pair come running in, wow, and of course the dog is chasing the squirrel. Or maybe in this story it's the squirrel chasing the dog, to be really politically correct, okay? The squirrel is chasing the dog everywhere. It, it goes into, into two backyards. One backyard is a kid's, a four-year-old's birthday party, which th they don't even notice the squirrel and dog are racing around because they're already racing around themselves. It has almost no effect 
on the chaos in, in the little kid's birthday party. On the other hand, it, in the other case, it goes into this sedate, prim uh, party of, of <laughs> you know, more politically incorrect possibilities. The, everyone's sitting there listening intently to the lecture. And suddenly there's this dog and squirrel. <laughs> um, <laughs> moose and squirrel. <laughs> dog, sorry, it's probably before your time. Bullwinkle and Rocky. <laughs> um, I grew up with them. Anyhow, do, so, so, so dog and squirrel are racing around. It completely messes up the, 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 the prim lecture, or whatever. <sighs> the prim lecture is like the cold environment. A little bit of disorder, a little bit of disordering energy. It just just wrecks it. It's a big mess. And it just it dramatically in, increases the disorder. Whereas adding adding a, the same amount of thermal energy and the disorder therein to the hot environment, the kid's birthday party, no significant, you know, modest change, minimal change. Is that okay? Based on that observation, we can start to I can start to sort of illustrate the movement of heat, why it happens from hot to cold, and actually why it's hard for it to go from cold to hot. Uh, the law of entropy in its approximately official form, I've already pretty much said it, is the, the entropy of a thermally isolated system never decreases. Um, it has to be written as never decreases rather than always increases because breaking, staying constant is a possibility. Rarely happens, but, but, it's, but it's not uh, out of the question. So it, it, as long as you have drawn the box around the system, hypothetically, you don't actually have to physically, you don't have to build a wall. Um, uh, then the, the entropy in that system never goes down. Okay? So now I can start trying to illustrate this. Um, what is, I, th this is more of, of a restatement of what I said that, that in this thermally isolated system, the total entropy has to, go, has to not go down. Break even or go up is, is allowed. But you can get rearrangements so that you can distribute the entropy funny. You can get a cold spot and a hot spot, for example. And, um, yeah. and, I, and I, I liken uh, moving entropy around to throwing out trash. Your, your dorm room or your, wherever you live. Uh, if, if you keep the door closed and effectively basically uh, isolated, if not thermally, then at least uh, the constituents inside the room can't change. You can't, no, nobody's bringing things in and out. Then it's disorder is going to continue to increase um, as days go by. As you go, I mean, you, I guess we, we leave you inside there. It's energy is going to be going. But if you're allowed to open the door and carry stuff out, you know, the cleaning crew goes in and psh, um, now the entropy has been taken out of it and moved elsewhere outside the system. So that's uh, like throw, throwing out the trash, like throwing out the entropy. So, so the, where we want to go with the illustrations is, is to actually, in a cartoon way, illustrate natural heat flow and unnatural heat flow. So natural heat flow uh, is, a, is a situation, for example, where you start with a hot object and a cold object, and you allow heat to flow the way it normally goes, which is from the hot one to the cold one. And the reason that, that this by itself satisfies the law of entropy is, is fairly straightforward based on this observation that a, that a joule of heat is more disordering for a cold object than it is for a hot object. So just, just, just the, oh, I was working two minutes ago. There, back today. Um, if you move a joule of heat out of the hot object, its entropy goes down, but not very much because a joule of heat is, the, the hot object just doesn't care much. Its entropy barely changes when you add an, a heat, heat to it, a joule of heat, so it barely decreases when you take out a joule of heat. So, so removing a joule of heat from a hot object, very small change in entropy, one little arrow. If you add that same joule of heat to a cold object, wow, it's very disordering. So the, so the entropy of the cold object goes up significantly, two arrows. And if you look at the net change in, in entropy for the two objects together as a team within an overall thermally isolated system, one joule down, uh, sorry, one, one unit down of entropy, one, two units up in entropy, that's one unit up in entropy, whoa! The law of entropy is happy. The law of entropy says, sure enough, the, the total entropy of the combined system 
didn't go down. In fact, it went up. That's, that's fine. So to do this very, very quasi-quantitatively, these are my two, two objects, the, the cartoon version thereof. They, have, they can contain various amounts of thermal energy, and associated with that thermal energy is entropy. So they have various amounts of entropy, and they're just number, just amounts, one unit, two units, three units of, of energy, thermal energy, and one unit, two units, three units of entropy. Remember, energy and entropy, different quantities. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, using this table, which is very somewhat arbitrary, and th this is not, we're not doing any serious calculations here. It's just as you add thermal energy to this object, not only will the thermal energy go into the object, but it will begin to develop some disorder associated with that thermal energy, some uncertainty where the energy is located, which is, which is a, a, a measure, which is, uh, appears in the measure of disorder. The, the energy is distributed in statistical ways and carries with it, therefore, uncertainty and disorder. So I'm going to start adding thermal energy to these objects and watch not only their thermal energy go up, but their entropy go up. At the moment, they have no thermal energy in them at all. They have no disorder at all. They're, they're, they're completely perfect. They're, they're as simple as they can be, as orderly as they can be. No problems. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's not the birthday party or any, it's a morgue. Okay. We're going to put one unit of thermal energy in to the first object. When I do that, I'm adding one unit of thermal energy to a very, very orderly system. It's going to be gold. It's basically effectively at absolute zero. And that one unit of thermal energy is highly disordering. It, it, it cranks up the entropy by four units. Big jump in disorder. Uh, I will add a second unit of thermal energy. When I do that, of course, the thermal energy goes up by, by another unit. And the entropy goes up, but not by four units anymore, because it's already got some disorder. So it only goes up to seven. We get a jump of three units, not four anymore. Think he's OK? I'll do the same. Ah, I'll keep going. Third unit, I'm at three units of thermal energy, and we only get two more units of entropy for this. So, so we're really getting pretty disordered. One more unit of thermal energy. OK, it's in. There it goes. And we're up to 10. OK. So we've got a hot object here, lots of thermal energy, and a very cold object, no thermal energy. And the total entropy for this system, and I'm going to touch them and make them one system, one thermally isolated system. We got a hot, hot, hot side and a cold side, and their total entropy is 10 units right now. Well, what, what would happen? Well, let's let thermal energy move. Let's let thermal energy come out of the first box and go into the second box. My prediction is the entropy of the combined system is going to go up and make the law of entropy dance and scream, woo, this is so good. And we'll watch it happen. So I moved the, the thermal energy. Therefore, this is only, this guy on the left only has now three units of thermal energy left. And the right one has one unit. But with that was a change, comes a change in entropy. The entropy of, of this hot one goes down slightly, because it's hot, and taking a joule of, a, a unit of thermal energy out doesn't have a big ordering effect. So go back to nine. The cold one, having received a joule of thermal energy, is, it started with none, no entropy. I'm sorry, no entropy. It was super cold. This is highly disordering. Whoosh, it goes up to four. Any questions about what I just did? We moved one joule, what, one unit of thermal energy. The total entropy now is nine plus four, 13. The entropy went up a lot. So the observation is when heat flows from a hot object to a cold object, the entropy of the pair goes up, and in this case, a lot, because they were really different in temperature. Let's move another joule, another unit of thermal energy. Out it comes, over it goes. Thermal energy goes down. Thermal energy on this right one goes up. The entropy goes down now. It's, it's getting cooler, but it's still pretty hot. It goes down by two units to seven, back to seven. And this one goes up. It, it's, it's still pretty cold. It's not super cold, but it's pretty cold. The, the entropy goes up by, by Three to seven. And now we're up to 14 units of 
of entropy. So we went from 13 to 14. Not as big a change, but it's still going up. And law of entropy, woo, good. How about we keep going? We move one more joule, one more unit of thermal energy over. This one goes down from two to one. It uh, this one goes up to three. The entropy on the left side, as it's getting colder, drops all the way down to four. And the entropy on the, for, the, for the right side, which is getting hotter, goes up modestly to nine. Uh-oh, the entropy is now 13. It's starting to decrease. So that last movement of heat, of uh, thermal energy, from, from the left side to the right side, actually created order. It, 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 uh, it violates the law of entropy. It's forbidden statistically. And, and just to back away, what did, I, what did I do? When the two of them, had both, each of them had two units of thermal energy. I, I'll, I'll, I'll undo that. Back, back. They both have two units of thermal energy and seven units of entropy. And if we assume they're identical objects, they're both at the same temperature. They started, they started one, hot, one hot, one cold, and they worked their way towards the same temperature, which was when they had the maximum entropy. They had the most disorder they could possibly have. And at that point, they can't keep moving heat around because if they do, one will become colder and the other will become hotter. That's forbidden by the law of entropy. It's statistically unlikely. So what, I, what, what this fun and games here illustrates is, is that the law of entropy, saying that the, 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 the disorder in an isolated, thermally isolated system never decreases, allows, in fact, encourages the flow of heat from hot to cold until equilibrium is reached, when the two, two objects have the same temperature, and then, then they're stuck. Um, they, can't, they can't continue to exchange heat, because if they did, one would get hot, one would get cold, and that is inherently ordering. If you have a hot object and a cold object, there is order in that, dis in that difference. It's not a random arrangement. Okay. So heat flows naturally from hot to cold because it cranks up the entropy. And it does that until the entropy gets to, to everybody's, you know, it's, it's, it's as maximum as it can get. Nothing you can do to rearrange things to make more disorder. That's where it'll stop changing. It'll stay, and it'll stay there. OK. Unnatural heat flow, and I, I've, I've just talked about that already. Same idea. If you move heat from a cold object to a hot object, you create more order in the cold object than you uh, make disorder in the hot object. The net disorder goes up, ah, it goes down, and you violate the law of entropy, it it never ha which is to say it never happens. It's not like you violate the law of entropy and the police show up. It's like you can't do it. Okay? Um, so th this one just to make you think about how, what an air conditioner does. Which way does an air conditioner move heat? From hot regions to cold regions, or from cold regions to hot regions. How many think that it moves heat from hot regions to cold regions? How many think it moves heat from cold regions to hot regions? How many are thinking? <laughs> it moves heat from the cold thing, your, the, your room air, to the hot thing, the outdoors. There may be a moment when you first turn it on when everything's all equal, but after that, it's making the cold thing colder by taking heat out of it and delivering it to the hot thing, the outdoors. You OK with that, particularly people who, who voted the other way? It definitely moves heat against the natural flow, from cold to hot. So it does, a, does something miraculous. Not so. It's, it, 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 it's still allowed under the law of entropy. But you've got to work at it. OK, so why does an, an air conditioner need electricity? Because the electricity provides the, the order. It provides order that is then consumed in the process of moving heat the wrong way. And a way of doing this, of trying to illustrate this, it, right now my, my boxes, which are touching each other and all, and, and exchanging heat as, as, as best they can, and have reached thermal equilibrium, let me pull them apart so that they can't exchange heat by contact. And let me deliberately. Let me deliberately bring, bring in some ordered energy and 
and I'm going to I'm going to run a machine that picks up thermal energy out of, out of this guy and I pick it up and in doing that I reduce the, to the thermal energy in this one by one unit and with it the entry by four down there to 14 and I'm going to use the order of energy to carry the heat outside. This is the inside. It got colder. It's down to low thermal energy. That's colder. Okay. It's going to carry the, 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 the order of energy is going to be involved in carrying the heat outside and depositing not just the order, not just the thermal energy outside, but the order of energy itself is going to become thermal energy and join the thermal energy that you carried out. So I pulled one unit of thermal energy out of the indoor air. I'm going to drop two units of thermal energy in the outdoor air. The, one of the units started as electricity. When I do that, I added two, so I'm now from two to four. And when I, if I add four units, two, two units of thermal energy up in here, we get all the way to 10. I have managed to break even. I've still got the same entropy. I, I started it at 14, if you remember, and I'm still at 14. This is allowed under the law, the law of entropy. I, I moved heat from cold to hot. I, I made a cold spot and a hot spot, and that by itself is forbidden. But I created, I, I made more thermal energy. I, it started as electricity, but it became thermal energy. And that thermal energy ended up in the hot object as added thermal energy. I've got more thermal energy than I started with. Up until now, I've always had the same amount of thermal energy. Now I made more, and with it, more entropy. And I managed to avoid violating the law of entropy. And this is what an air conditioner does. It, it picks up heat from inside. It carries the heat outside, an, an act that by itself would violate the law of entropy. But it uses ordered energy to do it, and that ordered energy becomes thermal energy. So that what's deposited outside is more thermal energy than was removed from inside the house. And when you sum up all the entropy, it didn't decrease. It's OK. It's allowed. Questions about that notion? Yeah, Neil. How did the electricity move the energy? There are a couple of different ways of doing it, but I'll show you how, how, the, how electricity does it. The electricity is, is playing with the states of matter and stuff. You can compressing things, uncompressing things. And in the process, it does work, and that work becomes heat. I'm, later in the process, OK? So here's the, here's the story. Here's how to do it. So the, the, the simplest of the air conditioners is, is, is this idea. Here's a, I've got a jug with a, a temperature gauge. There's a, a monitor in the middle measuring temperature. And it's reporting it here. The temperature is basically right at the, There's a green arrow there. It's, so th this is the temperature. That's hotter. That's colder. And what I'm going to do is I am going to seal the bottle, and I'm going to pump extra air into it. And the air is going to push in on the, con the, the inflowing air will push in as the air moves in. It's going to do work on the gas. Uh, and I'm going to do work on the pump to do it. Let me pump. Let me just guide. So I'm doing work pumping air into that bottle. And the temperature is going up. You see the temperature going up? I push the handle down. As the handle moves down, I do work on the pump. The pump does that on the gas. The gas, I've, we've added energy to this gas, and the only way a gas can handle energy, approximately, is by therm as thermal energy, the temperature goes up. So I now have a denser gas in, well, let's see it again. I'm making a denser gas that is hotter. As I do this, I, I'm not only adding molecules, I'm adding, I'm adding thermal energy, OK? It's now the hottest thing in the room, and heat is flowing out into the room from this bottle, the old-fashioned way, from, from hot to cold. If I now pop the lid on the bottle, watch what happens to the temperature. It plummets. The gas inside the bottle, which was at approximately room temperature again, but, 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 but extra density, therefore extra pressure, pushes its way out of the bottle. I pushed it in, and it, and it, it heated up because I did work on it. It's now pushing its way out of the bottle. And in the, that process, it's doing work on the surrounding air. It's using up its precious thermal energy. It's getting colder. So that now became the coldest thing in the room, and it, heat is now flowing into it from the room. 
let me, let me show you this, this version of the illustration more as a, as a human animation than anything else. So I've got a, I've got a syringe. You know, this is the syringe that, that you've always feared, like your, your vaccination is ready, right? With a needle this long. Okay. Although I plugged it up with, I just put a rubber stopper in there. So this is, it's packed in here. That's atmospheric pressure air at present at room temperature. Everything's very simple. If I shove the plunger in here, though, which is hard because I'm compressing the gas, its temperature rises. Not only is it becoming more dense, but I'm doing work on it. And therefore, it has more energy than it had before. That energy manifests itself as a rise in temperature. So far, so good? It's now hot, high pressure gas. And I do this outside. And it, it's now very hot. Heat flows from it naturally into the outdoor air until finally it becomes high pressure gas at, at outdoor temperature. It actually was above the outdoor temperature for a while. Now it's just at outdoor temperature. I carry it inside, back into the room, and I now let it push me out. It's doing work on me. So its temperature plummets. It's losing thermal energy. It gets colder. It becomes colder than outdoor air. It becomes colder than indoor air. It becomes the coldest thing in the room. So heat from the room flows into it, and the room air cools down. I then go outside again. I compress it again. And I compress it. It heats up, and heat flows out of it. I go inside. I uncompress it. I let it expand. It cools down, and heat flows into it. So I'm soaking. It's like a sponge. I'm soaking up heat here. I'm delivering heat here. I'm soaking it up, delivering it. And as I'm doing this, I'm doing more work on it now than it is doing work on me now. So I'm net provider of work. I'm like the electricity. I'm actually putting, investing more, I'm con conveying more energy to it in the form of work than I'm getting back. And my extra work doesn't vanish from the universe. It becomes heat outdoors. So this is a way an air conditioner can work. This is a pr very primitive air conditioner where you, com you compress, you outside, you compress a, a gas or what's gen generically called a working fluid. You compress it outside, and it heats up in the act of compression. And heat flows out of it. You go inside, and you let it expand, and uh, cools off and heat flows into, into the system. So it comes out, can you follow this? Or questions about this? Moving heat back and forth and back. And, and the work becomes heat in the outside. You, it's, it's, it's the, the mysterious work that becomes thermal energy. It's, it's my, I, okay. You okay? Real air conditioners, uh, this, is, this is how liquid nitrogen is made, uh, truly. They, they compress, well, actually, they start with air. They compress the air like crazy, it gets really hot. They let the heat flow out, and then they uncompress it. It gets really cold. And it gets cold enough, it, in principle, it could turn into, li into liquid if you, in that single step. In practice, you, they, they use a, a couple of stages of this to get really cold enough to turn liquid. But, but basically, they're, they're, they're just playing with the air. Compress it, uncompress it, compress it, uncompress it. And they make, they, the temperatures go up and down. It all lives properly under, under the guise of, outrageous, of, of the law of entropy, because the total entropy is going up. You're using ordered energy to do this process, and the ordered energy becomes thermal energy. You're paying the piper for the, for the entropy. In real air conditioners, though, they don't use a permanent gas like air. They use something that, that easily goes back and forth between being a liquid and a gas. They could use water, for example. You can make a refrigerator that's based on water. You, you start with water vapor outside. You compress it tightly. The water vapor heats up. The heat flows out of it. Now it becomes high pressure water vapor, which condenses into a liquid. And suddenly you have a, a, a container full, not just of, of, of dense gas, it's dense liquid. You bring the liquid inside, and you let it expand, and it evaporates. So in addition to this compression and uncompression of gas, you have condensation outside and evaporation inside. So just is something to, to, to think about as you, when you open your dorm fridge, which is a little air conditioner. Your dorm fridge is an air conditioner with its own little room. 
It's, it, it refrigerates the box in which you put the food. And the evaporator part is there with the food. And it's called an evaporator. That, that, that metal aluminum can that has the little ice cube trays and stuff in it, that's where the, this working fluid, which isn't water, it's another chemical, uh, goes from being a dense liquid to being a light, fluffy gas. And in the process, soaks up, it gets cold and it soaks up heat from your, from your food. And then it goes outside where it's compressed. That's actually the back of the refrigerator. There's a, there's, there are coils there where the, where the heat's coming out. Anyway, we'll, we'll, we'll finish it on Friday.